my name is Jennifer Cook. I direct the Africa program here at CSIS, and I just want to say a big thank you um, to you all for um, joining us today for what I think should be a very important and informative event. Um, this is an issue, wildlife trafficking and poaching in sub-Saharan Africa, that the CSIS Africa program has long wanted to get smarter on and delve into. And we're extremely grateful to the Wood Tiger Fund and to Andrew Curry, who's here someplace today, for, uh, for making this happen uh, and allowing us to bring such a great group of speakers and experts, uh, regional government officials, practitioners in the field, um, senators, <laughs> uh, and uh, policymakers. So we're, we're very grateful for that help. Um, we're tr this is an issue that has multiple dimensions and multiple and far-reaching dimensions. Uh, uh, it is a global problem that's going to require a global and multidisciplinary approach. Um, today, we're largely looking at the kind of ramifications and implications in Africa, the responses in Africa, although we know that this is a much bigger um, global, uh, global issue. Uh, its impacts on communities, uh, regions, security forces, uh, and of course the impact on elephant and uh, rhino populations uh, that are being rapidly depleted in, uh, and some, in some cases risk being extinguished entirely. So today I think our aim is to highlight the many dimensions of the challenges and the connections between them. Um, and in, more important I think is to talk about and examine and as assess some of the prom promising innovation and strategies uh, that groups, some, some of whom are represented here, are working on to, to, uh, to address the problem. I think there are new networks, new technologies, new partnerships that are happening on the ground uh, and that hold promise and that are worth profiling and, and supporting going forward. Um, after today's session, we're going to put out a brief report uh, highlighting some of the takeaways uh, of today's event. Uh, the event will be live webcast today, um, and it will be posted uh, further, it will remain on the web uh, going forward in, in a couple of days, it should be up there. And I hope that this is the first of uh, many more sessions here at CSIS that look at the various dimensions of this in greater depth but we couldn't have a better group of people to set this up than we, than we do today. Um, so I want to thank our participants, uh, particularly uh, those who are coming a very long way, uh, Cabinet Secretary Judy Wakungu from uh, the Kenya uh, Secretariat for Environment, Water, Natural Resources, Governor Dado from Tana River State, we have Johan Joost from Kruger Park, Ian Saunders from Savo, Jean-Marc Fremont of African Parks, Enrico Pinheiro, all of whom have traveled a, a great way to, to be with us today, so thank you. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, uh, and recognize Derek Schlickeisen, who has worked incredibly hard to bring all these participants together and, and make this happen, and to our staff, Ben Hubner, uh, Ngozi Olegeti, Haile Erzas, and Justin Gradick for all their hard work. I'm going to turn now to the speaker of the hour. Um, it is a great honor to introduce Senator Jeff Flake. Uh, he has been a very important voice and leader on this issue. Uh, Senator Flake has served as U.S. Senator from Arizona uh, since 2013, after serving in the House of Representatives for 12 years. He's chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Subcommittee on Africa, where he has been a real forward-looking, active champion um, uh, for U.S.-Africa policy on a whole range of issues um, and, uh, uh, and, and has been extremely important in elevating issues that may not get the kind of attention they warrant. Senator Flake has a long and abiding interest in Africa. He served uh, on a mission in southern Africa prior to graduating from college. He returned to the continent um, as executive director for the Foundation for Democracy in Namibia. That was at a really crucial fascinating time in Namibia's going forward, and his focus in the legislation ref reflects that kind of abiding interest, very much focused on how this impacts African communities, how you can engage uh, African communities and African partners, uh, really get at the source and uh, the, the people who feel the most immediate impact and who ultimately um, have to play a huge part in the, uh, in the solution. 
So Senator Flake, welcome. I know you're going to talk a little bit about your hearing tomorrow or, or bring that up. Um, we're, we're delighted to have you to, to uh, launch this event. And again, thank you for your leadership on the wildlife trafficking issue. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's a, I have to, have to excuse myself a little later. We have somebody with the temerity to negotiate a nuclear deal this week, and it's kind of uh, <laughs> thrown everything into a tizzy on Capitol Hill, and so it's, it's a very busy time there, but hope to be able to take a few questions afterwards. I, I really appreciate being here. Also want to give a special thanks to Dan Ash, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and Ambassador Luis Arriaga from the State Department, and the rest of the panelists who will be here today. I believe you'll be hearing also from Ed Royce uh, later. Ed has some legislation that uh, uh, we'll uh, certainly be taking up in the Senate uh, as well later. So I appreciate uh, the good work that's done here at CSIS. I've always been a fan uh, of CSIS and the work that you've done, uh, particularly in Africa. Back uh, when I started here in Washington, I was an intern in the office of Senator Dennis DeConcini, uh, the senator who preceded Senator Kyle, and I followed Senator Kyle. But during that time, I came as an intern to a, a couple of the functions uh, that uh, were held at CSIS and, uh, and then also worked with CSIS on Namibia and other African issues at that time. But uh, as you as was mentioned, uh, we have a hearing going on tomorrow in the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on Africa. Uh, and some of the panelists who are speaking today here will also be speaking there tomorrow. So appreciate uh, being able to yeah, use some of them there. Um, I, uh, as mentioned, I, my history with Africa goes back a ways. My first introduction to Africa was when I was uh, just a, a kid in the 70s. Uh, we had a, I grew up on a dry, dusty ranch in northern Arizona with 10 brothers and sisters. And uh, we had a, a consultant, a ranch consultant, who had come and, and go out with my father and his brothers on the F-bar uh, where I grew up. And uh, he happened to be from Rhodesia, uh, from former, what is now Zimbabwe. And uh, he was a game warden there at that time. His name was Alan Savory. He's become uh, pretty well known in, in some communities. But he, he talked about, uh, as we kids were around, he was telling us about Africa. We were just fascinated. And he said that uh, they used to fly their planes so low that giraffes would look down on them. And as a kid, I just, uh, I mean, that was it. I was hooked. And I just thought that that was the neatest thing, the stories he would tell uh, about uh, Southern Africa and the wildlife there. Uh, I then received a, a, a mission call from the Mormon Church to go to South Africa and Zimbabwe and spent uh, two years down there. And then later, as mentioned, I uh, was able to go to the country of Namibia in 1989, the one-year transition period uh, where Namibia received its independence. And uh, for a budding political junkie, that was nirvana to be there when a country has its first elections and drafts its constitution. Uh, but I also really enjoyed uh, um, being in Namibia and going up to Atasha and uh, also over to uh, uh, well, up to the Okavango Delta and, and also um, over to Chobe and, and elsewhere and on the Zambezi River as well, the Caprivi Strip, some of my favorite places in Africa. Uh, one, on one occasion, I took a group up uh, and we were in Rundu, just on the Okavango River, the border of Namibia and Angola. And we, on that occasion, We'd, we'd flown there and uh, had just a little had a bush pilot take us up there and we were floating down the river about uh, 10 miles to our lodge where we were to stay for the evening. And uh, we were a little overloaded on this uh, little makeshift boat that we had. And uh, about a couple hours in, it was already dark, about 10 o'clock in the evening or 11 o'clock. And I just remember the, the, our pilot there saying, uh, if it were light, um, you would see a bend in the river coming up. Uh, the river's about 100 yards wide at that point. Uh, he said, there's a bend, and the, the crocodiles sun themselves uh, every day out there on the rocks. And there, this river had a lot of crocs and hippos. And, and just then, he reached back and pulled the, the uh, cord to start the engine. We'd been just kind of drifting for a while. The engine had kept overheating, and it pulled the back of the boat down and swamped it, and we sunk. <laughs> we, we, we sank right in the middle of the river in the middle of the night. And, uh, and 
fortunately, we had the good sense to swim toward Namibia instead of Angola. There was a bit of a conflict still going on in Angola at that time. Uh, but, uh, but that was uh, quite an experience. It's the only time I've ever wished there was probably less wildlife in Africa than there, than there is. But we did make it to shore and then had to walk about a mile uh, down to our lodge along the banks of the river. And so it was uh, quite an experience that uh, I didn't tell my wife about for a while after that. She probably wouldn't have let me go on such adventures. Uh, but uh, but I've, I've always appreciated uh, Africa, and I, I've come to appreciate more uh, in this position as well uh, the impact that uh, poaching is having uh, not just on, on the wildlife population, but on local communities in Africa. And I know that's the subject of, of what we'll talk about tomorrow and, uh, and a lot of what you'll talk about today. Uh, we in the United States want to see uh, sub-Saharan African countries prosper. Uh, but we know that nobody wants to see this more than the Africans themselves. Uh, this is evidence uh, by the, you know, in the transformation we've seen a lot of these countries undergo in the past decades uh, to reconcile their past and move on uh, to a brighter future. You know, whether it's uh, fostering stability in the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo or the Central African Republic or realizing the full economic potential of Tanzania or Kenya. Uh, there's certainly a, a lot of work yet to be done. I hope to be traveling with the president actually next week to Kenya and Ethiopia. But uh, many internal factors contribute to some of the ongoing challenges, uh, but the external demand for elephant tusk and rhino horn certainly compounds uh, one critical challenge many of these countries uh, are struggling to address. And while the poaching of African wildlife, uh, it's, it satisfies Asian demand, it's certainly an African problem. Uh, and sadly, the problem threatens much of the progress that's been made over the continent uh, over the past uh, several years. Many of these countries have made great strides toward good government, uh, but certainly corruption still persists in some countries. And according to the State Department, uh, illicit wildlife trafficking generates as much as eight to $10 billion annually. Uh, that's a significant amount of money, and that kind of profit obviously can tempt uh, many government officials or others who don't receive a sizable government paycheck uh, to participate. Poaching also threatens international security. Uh, questions remain whether trafficking of wildlife uh, aids uh, the drug trade, or along with the drug trade, aids various uh, armed entities. Uh, there's evidence to suggest that that is the case. And it's certainly taking its toll on security at the local level. Traffickers uh, are responsible for killing uh, park rangers and other law enforcement officials uh, that are tasked with protecting wildlife and communities. Uh, poaching also threatens uh, many fledgling economies, as we know. Uh, wildlife tourism is one of the most lucrative sectors of many African economies, especially in East and Southern Africa. And hunters uh, from around the, the world will pay tens of thousands of dollars to hunt big game in Africa. But uh, far more important, uh, according to a study of the United Nations World T um, Tourism Organization, uh, wildlife watching tourism represents about 80% of the total annual sales uh, for trips to Africa. Elephants and rhinos are obviously some of the most popular with tourists, and uh, they're the ones most threatened by poachers. According to the African Wildlife uh, Foundation, poachers kill more than 11, I'm sorry, more than 100 elephants uh, across the continent every day. Experts also say that rhino horn is now more valuable than gold uh, or than cocaine. And it certainly makes uh, rhinos a walking treasure trove for poachers. And to put this in perspective, in 2009, 122 rhinos were poached in South Africa last year. 2014, uh, that number was up to over 1,200 in a single year in a single country. Uh, the longer uh, poaching persists, the fewer tourists there will be, uh, that, uh, and it will take a significant toll on the uh, economies of affected countries. Local communities are threatened by traffickers um, uh, who seek to recruit Africans uh, for, from low-paying jobs uh, with the promise of a larger payoff. Now, efforts are underway to reduce demand for illicit wildlife, particularly in Asia. As we've seen, however, demand reduction alone is not sufficient to stem poaching. It's certainly important, but probably not sufficient. Poaching needs to be addressed on the ground where it happens as well. 
Now, uh, we hope to address some of these uh, things tomorrow in the hearing. We'll examine some of the best practices for fighting poaching on the ground. Now, the President released a national strategy for combating uh, wildlife trafficking a year and a half ago. Resources are being expended to help uh, affected African countries uh, stamp out poach poaching, and uh, we need to make sure that these approaches are consistent with some of the best practices, as I mentioned, and that they have the, the maximum possible effect. Now, again, I appreciate uh, what uh, many of you in this room are doing, um, and uh, certainly for the role that CSIS is playing. I uh, look forward to any questions you might have, and again, thank you for what you're doing. I'm sorry that it has to be so short this morning. You have much more important uh, panelists to listen to uh, throughout the day. So thank you for having me here. Thank you so much, Senator Flake. Um, for that really uh, great start to the morning. I know that you have the hearing um, tomorrow. I, I wonder uh, if you might say, and I'll just take the prerogative of the first question here, if you might say a little bit on, on kind of the differing perspectives within, uh, within Congress on the, on, on the issue. In, in, in other words, are there kind of points of debate or discussion on the legislation or where where legislation is pri how it's one issue is prioritized over another within the trafficking uh, the, the, the couple of trafficking bills up now well greatly uh, gratefully um, in Congress uh, Africa and the African issues uh, don't tend to be as partisan gratefully as they as many of the issues in Washington right now that's uh, that's a, certainly a good thing. And so it's not that you have real partisan right. differences on these approaches. If you do, perhaps it's uh, levels of spending um, and, and how much we commit. And, uh, and also, uh, obviously, all of us want to have oversight and to make sure that we're using best practices and we look at what works. Um, there, if there is kind of a, a, you know, a schism, perhaps it's, you know, where do we focus our time? Is it uh, simply on reducing demand? in Asia, is that the best use of time and resources? I know there are a lot of good organizations working and doing some good work in that area. Um, is it the financing angle? Do we look at, uh, at, at clamping down there? Um, is it the community-based efforts? And my guess is it's gonna be a combination of all of them, uh, but there will be some difference of opinion on, on how much and where we focus uh, resources in that regard. Great, great. And I, it, what's striking is how complementary some of the legislation are, that they, together, they capture the full range of issues, and the, the challenge will be, as you say, balancing them, I think. Um, maybe we get some perspectives on that today. Let's take a couple of questions. Uh, it will take three. Um, the lady there, in the back. Tony. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and Dr. Lake. Thank you so much for your wonderful work and supporting Africa um, and responding to my letter, which I had sent you on ACOA and supporting ACOA to be passed. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is, and comment is, uh, Senator Flake, now that you are uh, Flake, now that you are here, uh, Africa. Oh, is there is so much opportunity. Looking at what we want to do with the poaching, how do we? Africa needs more funding on poaching because without funding and working with the local people, so when you go for hearing and that's what you should put emphasis on, we need support in poaching and animals in Africa. How do we do that? You are here and you've just talked about it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right. <laughs> well, thank you and uh, I hope you'll be able to attend the hearing. Um, there, there has been a commitment, as I mentioned, the president uh, at his program that he announced uh, just last year executive order, but uh, I believe uh, State Department and USAID have requested $28 million to combat wildlife trafficking. Uh, this is in addition to $113.9 million in biodiversity funding. So that we are committing resources here, and, and hopefully what we want to make sure is that those resources are spent wisely, and that uh, particularly the community-based efforts that we look at best practices and look at what has worked in certain countries, and, and uh, you know what works one place may not work in another. Uh, but but uh, hopefully we can find out uh, what's working best and, and assist rather than try to impose some proposal uh, that, that, that we think looks good but simply won't work on the ground. Thanks. Tony. Oh, I don't think I need a mic. Uh, Senator, uh, just a question on what, okay, 
<laughs> We're being webcast. <laughs> Even, yeah. Um, thank you, Senator. I'm just wondering what is being done on the demand side. You know, we're doing a lot on, on uh, interdiction of poaching, but are we doing enough in trying to curtail the demand and, and really having a serious discussion with the largest market for these poached goods, which is in China? Right. Right. Certainly uh, China and Southeast Asia as well. Um, that's where the, 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 the market really is. I know there are some organizations that I've met with that, that are uh, some nonprofits that are doing that. But I think some uh, well-known figures, Bo Derrick is involved in, in that effort, and, and uh, they've raised some pretty good money to do that and had uh, Yao Ming and, and others participate. I think that's important. I think that's wonderful. Um, and we, as we continue on this topic, we'll have hearings specifically on that issue. Uh, but I, I, I like I said, I, I don't think there's any one solution here, but that's a biggie, uh, because as long as the demand is there, we've seen it uh, on the drug side here. You can do all you want in Colombia in terms of trying to stamp out uh, uh, you know, the production, but as long as the demand is here, it, it finds a way. And I think the same is true to a large extent uh, in, with, with, with ivory and rhino horn. So uh, that's, that's certainly, an, uh, I think we can talk to those nonprofits who have already been in this area for a while and see where they have had success or where you can quantitate, uh, you know, quantify it, I'm sorry, uh, you know, what's going on and, and follow with resources. I think that's an area where Juan Zarati, who's a senior advisor um, to, to our program, we've talked about bringing in our East Asia um, program to, to, to try to get at that issue as well. Um, we have uh, the gentleman over here. We'll take maybe two more. Okay. I think the uh, gentleman here. Uh, Senator, I have a question on uh, direct action against poachers. Uh, with our increased uh, involvement with AFRICOM uh, and their acquisition of sensor data, what's the thought on sharing that sensor data with host nations uh, so that we can interdict the poachers? You know, that's a, that's a good thought. Um, I'll, I'll have to take that up uh, with the committee and also with, uh, uh, with, with AFRICOM. Um, I, uh, obviously, where we have information that can be shared and used for other purposes, uh, uh, that are good purposes, we ought to use it. So I, I would certainly favor that. Um, obviously, uh, AFRICOM has a mission that uh, is to uh, increase security in African countries and increase our own security. Uh, but uh, increasing security often means increasing the economic security in some of these countries, and that would, that would help. So um, if we uh, have uh, information that can be helpful, I would certainly favor using it. So good point. Yes. Final question. Sure. Oh. An embarrassment of riches. I'm getting two mics at once. Uh, thank you very much. I have a question that follows up on the demand side. Where is the U.S.? on the demand side of illegal ivory and rhino horn. I've read that we're not far behind China. We may even be ahead of China. The penalties in the U.S. for trafficking in these uh, commodities is very light, as we've seen when people are found in New York and so on. So, but I'm not sure. I'm not an expert on this, so I'd be interested in your information on that. I'm certain that some of the panelists later uh, can give a much better answer than I can, but my understanding is, uh, is that uh, um, well, certainly there, there is some demand and some illicit trade here. It is dwarfed um, by demand in Asia. And so and it, we certainly have better, uh, uh, better ways to track and, uh, and to prosecute. Uh, it, it may be that we need to adjust the penalties, and, and we'll look at that. But, uh, but I'd certainly look to the panelists today who have studied that closely. But my understanding is, and uh, what we're basing uh, uh, you know, our, our policy on certainly is that the demand side in Asia is really uh, eclipses everything else. I, I appreciate uh, being here. It's back to nukes, I'm afraid. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so thank you again for having me here, and thank you for what you're doing, and look forward to seeing some of you at the hearing tomorrow. So. Thank you. Turn to our next panel.
our great challenge will be staying on time today because we have, we have a very packed agenda. So I'm going to turn over to Juan Zarate, who's a, a senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a senior security analyst for CBS, and has uh, uh, served as deputy assistant uh, to the president and deputy national security advisor for combating terrorism. Uh, we're missing Kirsten and Enrico. And Juan, I, oh, hi. <laughs> I'll turn over to you. Hello, hi, how are you? Kirsten Sykes, USAID, pleasure to meet you. INL. Great. That's okay. Give <laughs> me a tight fit around here. Good morning, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well. Keep in mind we're being recorded, so be on your best behavior. Um, uh, my name is Juan Zarati. I'm a senior advisor here. I want to thank uh, Jennifer Cook and Derek and the entire AFCA program uh, here at CSIS for organizing this incredibly important event, which I think reflects the growing sense uh, and appreciation for the uh, complexity, importance, and challenge of the poaching uh, issues, uh, not just in Africa, but globally. Um, I'm honored to, to be a part of this, even though I'm not an Africa expert, um, in part because my prior service in government and, and current work um, focuses on uh, transnational threats uh, and the nature and the blending of those threats globally. Um, the opportunities that militant groups, uh, criminal organizations, even terrorist groups uh, have in conflict zones, the advantage that they take over economies, both local, uh, regional, and globally, uh, the illicit financing that is attached uh, to those networks and, and, work, and um, activities, uh, and frankly, the, the local, regional, and global threats to not just governance and sustainable uh, economies, but also to security. And I think there's a growing recognition, not just in the communities that we're all a part of, but also in uh, popular culture, uh, that this is an issue. Um, I've also been fortunate to be associated with Catherine Bigelow, who is one of um, the celebrities who's taken this as an issue uh, and really begun to focus on raising awareness around the threat to our natural security as well as our national security when talking about poaching and the threats that we, we collectively face. Um, Catherine produced a film called Last Days of Ivory, which has received some attention uh, and I think is blended well with a lot of the celebrity attention that's being brought to these issues. And so that's the, the context. Obviously, much attention, this conference reflects that. Uh, but what we have today uh, and this morning to, to set the table for our discussion uh, are four of the most important policy officials and experts on uh, this crisis. Uh, and in particular, we wanted to talk this morning about uh, the growth and opportunities in the policy realm. Because, of course, uh, to be able to deal with these issues, you need strategy, you need policy, you need resources, you need global cooperation. Uh, and you need uh, some novel approaches and perhaps new networks to be applied to the challenges and, and problems. And so with us today, let me just quickly introduce you have the bios in front of you. And for those of you watching online or who will, will be watching, you can find this online. Uh, we have, uh, again, four of the preeminent experts. Uh, Dan Ash, uh, to my far left, the director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, it was a key official from a policy and execution standpoint for the U.S. government on these issues. Ambassador Luis Adiaga, uh, who is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for uh, INL, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know, the State Department, uh, the bureau that deals with all of the international narcotics and law enforcement issues globally. Um, it may have the fourth largest air force in the U.S. government, if I understand correctly, um, and, uh, and quite an important policy uh, role and position. Uh, Kirsten Sachs, uh, the Senior Biodiversity Policy Advisor for the Bureau of Africa at USAID, has had numerous roles uh, in this space, uh, looking at not just the environment, but also policy implications broadly for USAID and the government. And of course, AID has a, a critical role to play in Africa and around the world. 
And then finally, to my immediate left, Enrico uh, Pironio, uh, who's the Africa Wildlife and Protected Areas uh, Specialist from the European Commission. Uh, and we're really grateful, Enrico, for you uh, to be here, because this obviously is not just an African issue, not just an American issue, but a global issue, and the European Union has a key role to play. And, uh, the, the European Commission has been leading on some of the policy innovations and awareness building in Europe and around the world. Um, so with that, let me just explain the logistics. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to present uh, very briefly for about 10 minutes. Some of them have slide presentations. We have uh, uh, the screens up uh, to be able to use uh, the slide decks. Um, then I'm going to ask a couple questions after those presentations, and then we'll open it up to all of you. Uh, afterward. We'll start with Dan and then just move down the line and uh, really look forward to this conversation. Thank you again. Thank you, Juan. Would you prefer we speak from here or from the podium? However you're comfortable. I think this is fine, though. Okay. If you'd like. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I am Dan Ash, the director of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, and it's a delight to be here with you this morning. And um, I guess um, in in uh, Juan's introduction, it was, uh, I, I gave up the mantle of expert a long time ago, um, and especially expert on Africa, although I did go there for two weeks in May and June. But, um, but I, so, but, um, so my um, perspective in this issue is one of a leader of, of one of the organizations that is at the tip of the spear um, for the United States, and I think it's important in this context to talk about the projection of leadership as, as, as the key ingredient um, in the uh, response by the United States to this epidemic of, of wildlife uh, trafficking. Um, the, and we, as we think about that, I would first draw um, your attention to the President's executive order on wildlife trafficking. As a more than 30-year veteran of Washington, D.C., it's easy to be cynical about um, things like executive orders. But I, I will tell you, in the past year, I have, I have been uh, renewed, my faith in, in the, an act, a bold act of leadership has been uh, renewed because we have been joined uh, by, the, um, by the Department of State, the Department of Justice, the Treasury Department, USAID, the Defense Department, and many others in this all-of-government approach that we now have uh, for, uh, to address wildlife trafficking. So that statement of leadership has, has been um, and will continue to be uh, a key ingredient in our response um, nationally and internationally. Um, I see the, the, that same then continuum and projection of leadership um, as Secretary Sally Jewell um, went to Vietnam and uh, China just this month, um, specifically on the subject of wildlife trafficking. The first Secretary of the Interior to ever um, take such a step and stand hand in hand in China with U.S. Ambassador Max Baucus speaking directly to the Chinese government about um, uh, key issues of uh, law enforcement and intelligence and particularly about demand reduction and how the U.S. and China can join hands, not as competitors but as partners in the endeavor to deal uh, with demand. We saw the same projection of leadership um, th through the U.S. State Department and with um, our partners in government when the Chinese came here several weeks ago for the strategic um, and economic dialogue. Again, key leaders in government talking face to face across the table about how we can cooperate together as, to, as the, the world's two most prominent leaders and most prominent consumers of uh, illegal and legal wildlife products. Um, we see that leadership in the United States Congress, and it is refreshing to have uh, someone of the character and influence of uh, Senator Flake here uh, to speak to us about this subject. And we see that same leadership um, with Chairman Ed Royce um, and his colleagues in the U.S. House of Representatives in moving uh, H.R. 2494 uh, to combat global wildlife trafficking. We see that with 
Dianne Feinstein and Senator Lindsey Thomas in the Senate introducing a predicate offense um, legislation, which is incorporated in, um, in Chairman Royce's bill as well, which will be um, the key new tool for us in uh, combating wildlife trafficking in the goal, with the goal to take what is now a low risk, um, high profit endeavor um, and turn it around, reverse that polarity so we have a venture that is high risk and low profit. Um, and that um, predicate offense legislation will be a key new tool in our arsenal. Um, again, bringing together the work of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and particularly the Department of Justice um, to, um, to bring these people to justice and, and, um, and, re and eliminate uh, the, the opportunities for financial gain that are really driving this trafficking epidemic. We are good at catching poachers. In the short term, we need to be better at catching poachers to stop the killing in the short term. Um, but in the long term, uh, they just make more poachers. Um, what we need to do is go after the people who are reaping the financial rewards um, of this um, trafficking epidemic. Um, that uh, projection of leadership um, extends down uh, to an organization like the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, where um, by the end of this year, we will have uh, law enforcement agents um, uh, stationed in U.S. embassies in, in China, in Vietnam, in Tanzania, in Botswana, um, and in Lima, Peru. Um, by this time next year, I would hope to have another five agents deployed so that we can begin uh, to gather the intelligence that is necessary uh, to take the war to the people who, again, who are making uh, the profit and make it a more risky venture uh, for them. This is a new venture for us, something that we have never done before, um, but we think it will be uh, one of the linchpins for us um, in this effort. Um, we're expanding and focusing our efforts in international cooperation and capacity building, and Richard Ruggiero will address those, I believe, on the next panel. Um, we are uh, trying to take the nation, again, with the encouragement of the President's executive order, um, to eliminate uh, the United States' role as a source of demand for uh, products, um, particularly like ivory. Um, and so we have now taken two measures uh, to tighten uh, the, uh, the uh, movement and sale of ivory domestically here in the United States. We will shortly uh, announce our kind of third leg of that stool, and we will virtually eliminate all domestic uh, trade in ivory in the United States. Again, uh, bringing, uh, putting us in the position of leading by example so that when we go to China, um, when we speak with Vietnam and we speak with Thailand, we're speaking from a position of leadership, that the U.S. is doing the hard work of limiting, um, strictly limiting its domestic markets um, in, in ivory. Um, I think that we also need to realize that as we deal with this issue, um, that uh, it is, involves much bigger pressures, and in my a brief trip to Africa, I, I saw the um, optimism of leadership um, and commitment in a country like Gabon. Um, and I felt the desperation of corruption in a country like Tanzania, um, where these issues are seemingly intractable. Um, but, and I, the, but the most powerful part of that trip for me, in a way, was the trip, um, the last day, the trip, the drive across Dar es Salaam to go to the airport. Uh, my wife was traveling with me, and we're in the crush of traffic in Dar es Salaam. It took us two hours to get from the embassy to the airport. Um, and 
this just continual crush of people coming up to the car, trying to sell us trinkets, um, young women you know, holding babies you know, into the window of the car, asking for money or to sell um, their wares. Um, and after, again, two weeks in Gabon and Tanzania and seeing um, many kind of magnificent sights, um, my, my wife looked at me across the car and said, if you were one of those people um, and somebody asked you or told you that if you kill that elephant, I will give you a year or two years worth of income, would you kill that elephant? And in the moment of pause, before I could say anything, she, she said, I would. Um, and so we have to realize that what we are dealing with is a global struggle for sustainability. And that unless we can deal with the bigger issues of population expansion and, and poverty, um, we, we will forever struggle um, with the issue of wildlife trafficking. So um, thank you for your commitment and thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. Thank you, Dan. Luis? Are we on? There you go. How about it? Okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Juan, for that kind introduction and for inviting me to join this very distinguished panel. I can assure you I am not <coughs> worthy, but I'm going to try. Uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to join forces with other stakeholders on efforts to fight wildlife trafficking. <coughs> the fact is that we're all here dealing with the consequences of criminals across the globe getting involved in wildlife trafficking. We think that there are three fundamental reasons for this, and I think some of them have been mentioned. Number one, there's a very low risk of detection and prosecution. And even if you are uh, uh, detected and prosecuted, the fines are very small and the jail sentences are very light. And thirdly, of course, there is the high rewards that come from getting engaged in that activity. It's already been mentioned that rhino horn is worth more than gold and cocaine. The Department of State is engaged in efforts to stop this uh, wildlife trade. We are, in fact, one of the three co-chairs of the White House Task Force on Wildlife Trafficking. The other two co-chairs are the Department of Justice and the Department of Interior. The office I represent the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs has over 30 years experience in strengthening civilian security and justice institutions around the globe. And what we're doing now is trying to bring all of that experience into the wildlife trafficking area. This didn't happen until around four years ago. Our efforts then are part of the President's uh, uh, National Strategy and Implementation Plan to combat wildlife trafficking and we are focused on three main areas. Number one, we're trying to leverage bilateral and multilateral diplomatic tools to strengthen international cooperation. Number two, we're supporting cross-border law enforcement cooperation among transit, source, and destination countries. And number three, we are trying to build the capacity of criminal justice systems to confront this crime. Let me then give you a number of examples of the things we have accomplished in recent, uh, in recent months. In terms of building international support, we have, uh, we have worked with other partner countries, especially in Peru, in the United Nations Economic and Social Council to encourage all 193 members to define wildlife trafficking as a serious crime in line with the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. You may say, okay, so what? What does that really mean? Two issues. Number one, because we have accomplished this, nowadays criminals who are liable, uh, who are uh, caught and convicted are liable to serve significantly more heavier uh, penalties than they were before. Number two, the designation of serious crime unlocks certain provisions of the convention that facilitate greater international cooperation uh, so, uh, such as the use of mutual legal assistance, assets, asset seizure and forfeiture, and other, other instruments that will help us hold the criminals accountable for these crimes. Another example, 
At the recent UN Crime Congress, an event in Doha that brought together about 3,000 government, civil society, and academic experts to discuss criminal crime, the member states who participated reached a consensus that recognized wildlife trafficking as a, quote, new and emerging form of crime in the final declaration. What this really means is that that declaration is the basis for the UN Crime Commission to conduct this work in, com in the coming five years. This means this there will be more international programs aimed at fighting wildlife trafficking. We're also partnering with the International Consortium of Combating Wildlife Crime, some of you may know it as IQIC, by providing $5 million over the last two years to deliver training and capacity building to nearly 30 countries and about 700 justice officials. We're also using regional mechanisms. In December, we funded uh, the creation of the ASEAN Legal Task Force for Wildlife, which is a group that is developing a legal handbook, a toolkit, and training courses for government officials in ASEAN. The objective is to make these officials aware of some of the legal tools that are available to go after poachers and traffickers. We also supported Thailand's proposal to ASEAN to include wildlife trafficking as a new priority area, and we hope that the ASEAN ministers will approve that proposal at their next meeting. We're partnering with international organizations such as the UN Office on Drugs and Crimes. That office, for example, in January and February conducted training for 90 prosecutors from Laos. We're also co-funding projects that help develop new and unique tools and technology to combat wildlife trafficking. For example, like the UNODC World Bank Forensic DNA Analysis of Major Ivory Seizures. This is work that is led by Dr. Sam Wasser at the University of Washington. The analysis has uh, identified some very specific poaching hotspots. We used to think that uh, the, the, the hotspots were all over the place, but they are much fewer than what we thought. And we're also learning that organized criminal groups tend to consolidate shipments in container ports out of East, Af Af East Africa and some out of West Africa. Those shipments sometimes follow some common transit path throughout Southeast Asia to their destination countries in the region. So we hope that this knowledge will help us shape our strategy and disrupt the criminal networks by finding those pressure points along the ivory trafficking path. The results, by the way, of this study were recently published in the journal Science. Now, this is a very small glimpse at some of the work that the State Department is doing in, in this area. Our ultimate objective is to have a world where these iconic species are protected and no longer on the verge of extinction. To achieve this, we are committed to remain our efforts to strengthen international law enforcement cooperation and to continue to strengthen the consensus around the very simple and clear concept that wildlife trafficking is a serious crime and that we must work together to address it. Thank you very much. Luis, very helpful summary and, and survey. I'm going to come back to a couple of issues you, ra you raised. Uh, Kirsten, next to you. Is that on? Yes, ma'am. Great. So, Juan, thank you very much for the introduction. Everybody else has added a disclaimer, so here goes mine. Um, so, I work for the U.S. Agency for International Development. Um, that said, I'm only a few weeks on the job, um, but I actually come from the conservation world, the NGO world. So, for the last uh, 12 years, I worked for the Wildlife Conservation Society, and with the Wildlife Conservation Society, oversaw all of our work in Central Africa. And a large part of that portfolio was actually U.S. government funded. So I feel very, very comfortable um, having done a lot of the implementation on the ground, working with USAID funds and U.S. Fish and Wildlife funds um, about speaking about what's happening actually on the ground. So very quickly, uh, next slide, please. I wanted to talk a little bit about why is a development agency interested in, in this. And specifically, biodiversity is the foundation for development. So we have about uh, greater than 1.6 billion people who depend on forests for their livelihoods and greater than 2.6 billion people who depend on fisheries. So ecosystem services, of course, benefit everyone. Um, so wildlife crime is a development issue. It is something that undermines security, law, and order, and it undermines years and years of development um, gains. Next slide. 
So USAID's approach is very much a comprehensive approach to combating wildlife trafficking, uh, mainly focusing on 25 countries. The budget in and about $50 million on combating wildlife trafficking. And this is on top of the $250 million that goes into biodiversity work. USAID is positioned to really have um, deliver on these issues in the sense that it has a long-term presence on the ground through all of the USAID missions across Africa, a vast geographic presence, not only because of the missions, but we work with a large array of NGO implementing partners on the ground. And because it is a government agency, as, as Dan was saying, it has the ability to co a convening power. It can talk government to government, and it can interact at the policy level in addition to helping on the boots on the ground. Next slide. I wanted to quickly just bring up this slide. We know the problem. We know what's happening with elephants on the ground. But why this slide is important, because it wasn't until U.S. government started investing highly in the Central Africa and in the Congo Basin rainforest that the NGO partners with funding from USAID and funding from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service actually collected these vast data sets to show what was finally going on on the ground. We knew we had a poaching crisis in East Africa, Southern Africa. We could see dead elephants on the ground, much harder to see under the canopy. And so it was these data sets that were pulled together that actually showed us what was going on on the ground. And next slide, um, it showed that we actually had a 76 percent decline in elephant populations over the last decade. Um, so what, what is USAID doing on the ground to kind of combat this? Next slide. The main solutions I kind of think are in three categories. So there's the anti-poaching, the law enforcement work on the ground. There's then the anti-trafficking and, and combating trafficking work. And then there's the demand reduction. So very quickly, this is another example from Central Africa where USAID is working in areas where communities have no land tenure, but working with communities to develop um, governance structures, to develop land use plans, and by so doing, transferring management to communities, increasing their capacity for natural resource management, which end up in ecosystems which are better managed, and also communities that have use of rock land tenure. So this then actually leads to stability and also um, security within these areas. Next slide. Similarly, in East Africa, wow, that's dark, um, you have a situation where the USAID has been supporting the Northern Land Trust Trusts in Kenya. Um, it's 27 conservancies um, managing about 8 million acres of land. And here you see where you get trained eco guards on the ground um, communicating not only amongst themselves but also with the Kenya Wildlife Service. Um, you have much higher levels of security and stability, and that's what the people actually appreciate, and that you have wildlife populations that are doing much better than the surrounding lands. Um, similarly, next slide, in Namibia, um, very, very long-term presence. USAID has funded uh, community conservancies in Namibia for the last 13 years, and these have actually done very well in terms of increasing the livelihoods of the local people, increasing their um, ability to actually um, manage the lands in which they're living, and there's been the, the added benefit of the wildlife populations actually doing much better because there is this presence on the ground. Next slide. So kind of the next large um, area of, of intervention on the ground is actually working with the private sector, engaging with the private sector. As I mentioned, USAID has a very large network of um, NGO partners on the ground. And working through the NGO partners, a lot of these um, protected areas in which they're working are surrounded by logging concessions. The vast majority in Central Africa actually is concessioned. So USAID and its partners have helped the concessions to actually become FSC certified. So we now have 20,000 square miles which are certified in the Congo Basin. And this, of course, is great for the, the concessions because they actually can then access these um, markets that give them premium prices on their products. And it's great for um, wildlife because it actually makes them implement best practices in terms of combating wildlife trafficking. Uh, next slide. This is the area where USAID is spending the vast majority of its money, really working with um, partners on the ground to develop stronger protected areas. Um, if you could click to the next slide. As devastating as that, that data that I showed you at the very beginning were that we lost 76 percent of the elephants in the last decade, these data also gave us a glimpse of what is the actual solution. Where you have eco guards on the ground, we have seven times more elephants than where we don't. So the anti-poaching is absolutely critical. So USAID is investing heavily on um, working with governments to increase their ability to manage their protected areas. And just within the last year, so in 2014, um, USAID has funded a, approximately um, 1,000 individuals to be further trained in, in law enforcement, and this has actually led to the um, arrests of about 500 poachers on the ground. Uh, next slide. 
Also, monitoring and accountability and, and knowing what's going on in these protected areas is absolutely key. USAID has focused a lot of time and attention in rolling out SMART, which is a law enforcement monitoring tool. Um, in the last couple of years, three major um, workshops in East Africa, South Africa, and Central Africa to help roll out um, the SMART tool across, across the uh, network of protected areas and community areas in, in which people are working. It's really crucial that the, this tool be used because it really helps increase the efficacy and the efficiency of law enforcement on the ground. Next slide. Um, this is a slide showing Gabon National Parks. People will talk about that today. And it shows where smart data are being collected in these national parks. You can see exactly where the patrols went. It shows patrol coverage. It shows patrol effort. And it shows where the poaching pressure is. So it allows managers very, very quickly to see where they need to invest in certain protected areas. And also it shows the headquarters where they need to use their very limited conservation resources in terms of where they can actually are the biggest problems and where they can where they can highlight successes. So not only is this is working on at the protected area level, but with US government support, the government of Gabon has rolled out um, this across the across the nation as a national system. Um, Republic of Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, we're working on that now, and Tanzania will be coming in next to roll out SMART across across all of its protected areas. Next slide. Um, so now if we start looking then at the, the trafficking aspects, one of the things, and this is again an example from Central Africa that USAID is invested in, is working to increase um, the, improve the, and strengthen the criminal justice system, um, working through the Eagle Network on the ground in the Republic of Congo and now also in DRC. So this, these projects, the Eagle projects, work to increase the um, efficacy in the application of the law by training jurists, and it also works to look at novel approaches on ways to deal with corruption. Uh, next slide. Legal reforms, this is an area where, again, because the US um, AID is a government agency, we can work on a government-to-government -government level um, on work and help them develop um, legal um, frameworks to support um, and wildlife support combating wildlife trafficking on the ground. So I think a nice example here is in 2014, um, the government of Mozambique developed a new um, conservation law which actually criminalizes all wildlife trafficking, and the U.S. government was working with this on them. At the same time, coming this comprehensive approach of working on the ground in the most important areas for wildlife to help get the boots on the ground, the law enforcement on the ground. Uh, next slide. International cooperation, as, as my colleagues have mentioned, is absolutely crucial. USAID engages a lot on, um, in the border areas through its partners and through working with USAID and Fish and Wildlife. There's been support in the border areas, for example, of the Northern Republic of Congo, Cameroon, and CAR to make sure that there's transboundary um, patrols in these areas so that wildlife um, criminals cannot just escape across borders. The same in the borderlands of Tanzania and Kenya. Next slide. And um, one of the other solutions that USAID is investing quite a bit of, of time and money on is increasing detection. I think some of the best examples here are, for example, in, in Asia, where um, the, uh, as, as Luis, I believe, mentioned, support to the Asian um, Wildlife Enforcement Network, the Asian um, WEN. And in this capacity, the U.S. government and AID has actually funded uh, the training of about 8,500 law enforcement officials on <coughs> wildlife tra trading. And this has actually had a, resulted in a tenfold increase of, of confiscations of, of, <coughs> of wildlife products. And then in China, for example, where USAID has a flagship program called ARREST, um, they are working um, there to um, reduce um, the online um, sale of ivory, and it's been a 90% reduction in online ivory auctions due to this program. And then finally, the example you see here, uh, man's best friend, sniffer dogs, incredibly effective on the ground. USAID has supported sniffer dogs in, in um, Kazakhstan, are now supporting the sniffer dogs being brought into the Juba Airport in South Sudan, and also to the ports in Mombasa. Um, next slide. A quick mention on, on demand. This is obviously um, a huge portion of, of what needs to be done is addressing the demand. Two kind of nice examples here. USAID, again, under the arrest program, um, does a lot of awareness and campaigns in Vietnam, Thailand, and in China, um, where they're reaching about 740 million people on the ground about these issues. And another program is um, called I Think. This is a very interesting one because it works to develop um, public service announcements by key opinion leaders, which encourages personal responsibility on the issue of wildlife products. Um, and just quickly, I wanted to go back to the data because this is where um, USAID and the US government, like I say, has supported the collection of lots of wildlife data across the region. Next slide. Um, 
we actually know that a lot of these approaches work, that these actually things are succeeding on the ground. So this is just two examples of two parks in um, Congo, so the Nibali and Doki National Park and also Kankwati Duwali National Park that has had long-term investment by U.S. government through USAID and through U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And despite the fact that populations of elephants have crashed um, by 76 percent in Central Africa, in these areas we have stable and secure elephant populations. So we know that these approaches work on the ground. And the last slide is just a little bit looking forward in terms of what USAID wants to do in the coming weeks and in the, in the coming months. Um, first of all, uh, next we go, is to scale up these effective models. As I said, we know what's working on the ground, so we really want to scale up and take these to scale across Africa, the things that we know are working. Um, next, improve the use of technology. It really is an arms race, so you have, um, you have poachers out there on the ground, and it is an arms race with, with our law enforcement officials. Uh, USAID has just released its um, Wildlife Crime Tech Challenge, so we, the first round of that is just closed, and this is where we're trying to source innovative science and technology to address wildlife trafficking. I just heard the results of the first call yesterday, a really interesting, we have about 299 concepts that are in from 53 countries. 86 percent of these concepts come from people who have never received USAID funding, and 53 percent of these concepts are for people who have never worked on wildlife trade or trafficking. So trying to get the best of the best and new ideas coming to the forefront. And then finally, um, as, as everyone knows, the transport sector is absolutely critical to stopping wildlife crime. So USAID is going to be focusing a lot on working with the transport sector, the logistics sector, through the routes program to try and address the issue of trafficking um, um, across borders. Thank you very much. Incredibly comprehensive. Huh? <laughs> Kirsten, thank you very much. Enrico? Yes. Um, good morning. My name is Enrico Pironio, and I'm working for the Director General for uh, International Cooperation and Development at the EU Commission. It's sort of ministry or department, uh, if you're not aware of how, how it works. Um, I have a double handicap. First of all, I have a very poor English, so I apologize for those who don't understand me, and, and I have to find, to find my words. I, I daily speak four languages, two home and, and three at work, so it's, complete, <laughs> it's quite a mess. And, uh, secondly, I am the last one to present something, and it's o obviously there are many things which have been said, which may seem like a sort of repetition and so on. Um, what I want to say is, the European Commission has been supporting management of a significant number of uh, protected areas in Africa since, since 30 years, and um, with some programs, um, especially in Central Africa, which have been quite uh, emblematic, uh, and we have put really a lot, of, a lot of efforts. I will not enter into the details of the type of activities, because they are more or less the same that uh, Kirsten uh, told. So, um, what we felt now is that we, we needed really to, to have a, a more comprehensive view and really to develop a, a strategy because all these project programs have been done a little bit um, in, in a not coordinated way and, uh, and so on. So we developed uh, a document, you see the title, Larger Than Elephants, Inputs for a New Strategic Approach to Wildlife Conservation in Africa. Only to explain the, this title, it could take more than half an hour. Why, why this? Um, first of all, why larger than elephants? Uh, larger than elephants because the problem is are not only elephants and, and rhinos. There are many other species which are threatened uh, in Africa. And uh, if you go outside and you ask people, they, they will know about ivory, they will be, know about rhino horns. But if you talk to them that the, probably the third uh, traffic is about pangolins, many people will not n even know what a pangolin is. And maybe people here don't know what a pangolin is. And this is also for many other, many other species. Um, the second, oh, well, come back, yeah. Also, why an input for a strategic approach to wildlife? We wanted to, to have a strategy for the European uh, Union. Uh, but then uh, strategy has a specific meaning in our administration. We could not talk about the strategy, so we had 
So we, we said about strategic approach, and well, this is a very complicated and, uh, and depends really on, on, um, on pro procedures. And so finally, it's uh, input for a new strategic approach, but basically it's a strategy, and I will, be, I will speak about the strategy. Uh, next slides. Uh, yeah, next, please. Well, if you can go, back. this is how the different, the mainly protected areas we have been uh, intervening in the last uh, 30 years. There are much, much more, uh, but these are the more, uh, more important. Um, the reason for developing this, uh, this strategy um, came obviously from the growing global awareness of the wildlife crisis in Africa. Uh, there has been a lot of talking in the last two, three years about uh, heavy poaching on elephants, on rhino poaching, and, and these issues. But um, as most of the conservation practitioners know, uh, this is not really uh, something new. Uh, the wildlife crisis is long, uh, something which is going on from, since a long time. And just very recently, it has been brought up by the media or by some spectacular actions like uh, the, the massive killing that occurred in, um, in Cameroon in February 2012. Uh, but this decrease is something which is uh, since, a, since a long time. And, um, and the reasons also for this uh, wildlife uh, decrease, uh, African wildlife decrease, are, are various, uh, and, and not, it's not only, only trafficking. And so we wanted really to have a sort of comprehensive strategy. Uh, trafficking uh, and poaching by um, uh, heavy harmed poachers and, and uh, poaching for trafficking and uh, exporting to Asia or to other destinations is certainly extremely important. But there are other reasons which are maybe more important of uh, wildlife decline in Africa. Uh, I will just give an example of two. Uh, bushmeat. I know, I know that you know very well. Bushmeat, according to recent, uh, to recent uh, uh, um, statistics, uh, recent uh, research, uh, only in Central Africa, the estimation is between four and five million tons of bush, bushmeat per year. This is enormous, and it has an enormous impact on wildlife, and all wildlife, not only, I mean, on small monkeys, on small antelopes, on, uh, on rats, on other things. The other big issues is um, fuel wood and charcoal. Uh, just to give a figure, that this figure of uh, a couple of years ago, but I mean, probably it's worse now. Only in the town of Kinshasa, who has eight to 10 million inhabitants, more or less, the daily consumption of fuel wood is two kilos, uh, sorry, how many pounds? Four pounds? 4.5 pounds per day per inhabitants. Only in Kinshasa, 10 million people. You can imagine the impact that has. And, and this is all the other towns. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, the fuel wood and charcoal has an impact on the habitat, destruction of the habitat, and so on. Without talking, obviously, about uh, uh, agriculture, um, uh, agriculture extension, about uh, uh, the agriculture development, uh, uh, industri industrial plantation, and this sort of things. Another issue as well, and that's quite obvious, is uh, climate change. The impact of climate change, the impact of demography, I mean, which is extremely important. So, the idea of of trying to elaborate this strategy was was very simple. We know that there are many factors affecting uh, wildlife. We know that the, we have limited resources. We can have a lot of financial resources, but they are anyway limited. So we had to try to prioritize our intervention. If we want to do something, if you want to hope to save at least partly this wonderful wildlife, we have to prioritize our, uh, our interventions. And that's how came uh, the idea of, uh, of doing this, uh, this, this document, this strategy. 
and the idea was also to try to coordinate the intervention because, as I said in the past, we intervened in a not coordinated way. Coordinated inside the Commission, inside uh, our own departments, but coordinated with also with other donors and with USAID and with the, uh, other people intervening. It's, it's quite funny, by the way, uh, that we are working I think that I, I met for the first time Richard Ruggiero today, and we are working, I'm working since 30 years in, uh, in conservation in Africa. He's working, I, I don't know, maybe the same. Mm -hmm. And it's the first time we, we meet. It's, it's something which is not normal. It's not his fault, it's not my fault, it's, it's life in land there, but it's not normal. Yeah. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, next one, I will come back on that one. So, uh, so the, the scope of this, of this document was to identify uh, the scale of the threats uh, and to try to find the most appropriate uh, responses for the next 10 years. We fixed 10 years a time frame. Why 10 years? Because if we don't solve the problem in the next 10 years, uh, then the situation will be dramatic. With the, with the, the numbers of uh, elephant decrease, with uh, rhino, uh, rhino uh, poaching and with all, all the species decreasing so in uh, so uh, dramatically, if we can't find the solution, we cannot, we, if we cannot uh, reverse the trends in the next 10 to tw uh, 15 years, then the battle will be lost and the war will be lost. Uh, the other point, as I said, it's not limited to wildlife trafficking. Wildlife trafficking is certainly important. It's, it has links with terrorism. It has links with security. Uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's something which has raised the attention of, of, uh, of politicians uh, because of the implication, but uh, it's, not, uh, it's not the only cause of uh, wildlife decrease. And uh, we are also, I am working in a department which deals with international cooperation and development. We have to look at all, also uh, at, uh, at conservation and sustainable management of wildlife for the benefit of people. Our global uh, objective in my department is reduce poverty, so we have to look at this aspect as well. Um, uh, yes, next uh, slide, please. So we had this, uh, this study, which was carried out by some, some experts. We share it with uh, most of the most important uh, NGOs, partners, stakeholders. We had a big meeting. It was, uh, we integrated all the remarks, observation, and so on. And so we can say that we have now a, a document, a strategy, let's go like that, which really uh, covers most of the preoccupation of the people working in wildlife conservation. What I want to say also um, is that this work is not finished. Uh, we were quite in a hurry because we are in a programming exercise and we wanted to give food for thinking to the people who are programming our, uh, our aid. So we were quite in a hurry to do that. Uh, and there are certain things which are still missing, but this, this, this is a work which is still going on. Uh, one thing that was mentioned uh, was inland water, freshwater fisheries, which is extremely important, which are not foreseen in that document. It will be for the next, uh, the next phase. Uh, also, uh, marine conservation uh, has not been properly addressed. We will address it um, in, the, in the few months. Next slide, please. So the causes, the, the causes of wildlife decrease, obviously it's poaching, uh, poaching, uh, heavy poaching for elephants, for rhino, for ivory, uh, but also, as I said, bush meat, two pictures you see there. It's obviously the habitat destruction for fuel wood, for agriculture, for, uh, for the reason. It's demography, uh, and demography will be dramatic in the next uh, years in Africa. And, uh, and then, um, yeah, you will see uh, trafficking hotspots. This is taken from, from a document of someone who will speak later on. Yes, next slide, please. Next, yeah. Climate change, obviously, we have to take into account climate change. Climate change may have a tremendous uh, impact, and we have to take this uh, also in, uh, into account. Next, please. Demography. Big problem as well, it has already been mentioned, we have to mention again, poor governments, 
corruption, weak legislation, civil conflict, all these are affecting uh, and all these, have, these issues have to be tackled and also obviously uh, other economical aspects. Next slide. So our uh, strategy, uh, let's call it like that, proposed uh, uh, intervention at three levels, site level, uh, protected areas. We feel that protected areas are extremely important. We need to protect uh, what is still there uh, at the national level and uh, at the international level, all things which have already been said. Uh, what was important, as I said, that we want to prioritize. So we looked uh, at site level. Next, please. Uh, we looked at site level and see what, what, what were the areas which, uh, to our point of view, were most important. Uh, there are more than 6,000 gazetted uh, protected areas in Africa. I mean, it's impossible to pretend protect all of them. Most of, most of them are pro uh, paper protected areas, paper parks or whatsoever. We really have to concentrate on those who uh, are important and where uh, we can have uh, results. And we found, uh, to, in our strategy, we identified about 300 uh, protected areas, uh, which are grouped in about 80, 80 to 85, I think the, the figure is a little bit higher, uh, key landscapes. And we said, okay, that's where we have to concentrate our efforts. Uh, that's an, an uh, which was not the case in the past. In the past, we tried to intervene where, uh, where there were requests and, uh, and according to to other criteria, now we really want to concentrate on this one. It's important to manage these protected areas, to have all these, all the activities which have been, been described, which we are, we are doing, obviously. Um, we have also to look at the population, uh, improve livelihoods around. That's why we consider uh, uh, landscapes and not only protected areas. We have to work with the population, with the community, uh, communities we're living around. We have to make development projects so that to avoid uh, too much pressure on the protected area. Uh, and we have to look at the big problem of uh, sustainable management of biological resources, bushmeat and fuel wood. And that's really a big, big problem. Um, I would say, uh, and I'm maybe I'm provocative here, I would say that uh, fighting uh, heavy poacher, uh, fighting uh, poacher, poacher, poaching done by armed group, by terrorists, in a way, it is more easy uh, than uh, trying to solve the bushmeat problem or the fuel wood problem. This is much more complex. We don't, I mean, uh, fighting poachers, we could find the answer. I mean, you send a group of uh, uh, well-armed guys, helicopters, uh, you use modern technologies, drones, whatsoever, and you can control that. To try to control the problem of bushmeat and fuel wood, this is really, we don't have answer. We, we don't even understand exactly what is the extent of the problems. So that's, that's really a big, big problem. And we don't know what to do with that. And especially that bush meat is something that touches the population. It's linked to food security. People are, are living with uh, about bush meat. People, they need fuel wood for, to, for cooking, for, for many. So it's, it's extremely important and we don't have answer to that. But we have really to address this issue and to study these issues because they are extremely important. Next slide, please. We have at the national level to intervene, obviously, on institutional strengthening of uh, organizations which are uh, responsible for management of wildlife, conservation uh, for uh, protected areas. Uh, we have also to, to fight against uh, illegal trafficking at the national at the national level. Uh, we have again the problem of bushmeat, fuel wood. Also, it is a, a regional problem. By the way. Uh, Bushmeat is also uh, the subject of uh, the object of, uh, of trafficking. I mean, uh, uh, we know that there is quite a lot of bushmeat that comes uh, into Europe. Uh, uh, there have been surveys made at the airport Paris, and uh, they found during a short period about uh, five tons a week of uh, bushmeat coming uh, uh, into the Paris airport. And 
the same, I suppose, is for London, Brussels, and, uh, and the other major cities where we, we have Af a lot of uh, big African population. Uh, fuel wood uh, is also the, uh, the, subject, the object of uh, trafficking between Eastern Africa and the peninsula, the Arabic Peninsula. So it's, al it's also entering into these problems. Next slide, please. And obviously, as it has been said, and I'm not going to repeat, we have to address the demand side. We have to uh, to work uh, uh, to make awareness programs, and we have all uh, foreseen this in our in our strategy. And we want to support uh, uh, organization like UNODC or like Eagle, which has already been mentioned. We are also working with Eagle. Uh, for the moment, like uh, like USAID, and so it's quite a comprehensive. Uh, please, next one. So we have a, tried to estimate how much that would cost. Uh, that would cost more or less, uh, according to different evaluation that we have done, to uh, to implement this strategy, about 770 million euros, which is uh, 800 million dollars, more or less per year, and this we need for the next 10 years. Uh, it's look quite a lot of money, but if you look at uh, the funds that are available for other uh, development activities, it's, it's really not so much, and if you, if you imagine the impact that can, this can have on the African environment, I don't think this is uh, too much. Can we come back at the second uh, slide, sorry. It's a little bit mess. I think it's the first uh, slideshow that I, uh, PowerPoint that I, I prepare. So you've done it well. <laughs> uh, the se the second one, back, 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 back. Yeah, no, no, the uh, no, at the on the other side, <coughs> going going back. Stop. Yes, stop. That's right. This is what we at the European. Uh, union are going to commit in the next seven years. Uh, it's about one billion euro. It's for seven years, and we said that we need about uh, six to seven billion uh, dollars for the next ten years. So we are a little bit short, but that's what uh, we are going to do. Uh, the um, our commitments are based on the document on the strategy that I proposed. It was a very short presentation, but the strategy is about 600 pages, uh, and it's quite detailed for every region what we foresee to do and these sort of things. So we are, we are very short. Um, another important thing that I would like to say is that uh, we are short and we have to find solution. And a solution that we've, uh, the, the problem in implementing such a strategy is that our, our worst enemy, and I speak uh, from 30 years of experience in the Commission, our worst enemy is procedures. Our procedures, our commitment procedures, spending procedures, funding procedures, it's terrible. I think that procedures have killed more elephants than poachers. <laughs> And um, so we have to find solution on that. I mean, the idea are there. The idea are common. They are, they are, the idea are shared. We, we have shared idea with all the NGO communities, with all the donors. We know exactly what to do. Uh, we know we, we may not agree on the priorities, prioritization, but we know what to do and how to do. And what, uh, the problem is how to do it. <coughs> and that's a big problem. So, what this uh, document brings uh, as a, a new idea is to create a trust fund for the implementation of this strategy. Um, we have the possibility uh, since uh, January 2014 to create trust fund uh, at the EU Commission. It's a new regulation. It was forbidden before. Now we can. So we have we have the tool. The financial regulation allows us to create EU trust fund. That's what we want to create. Why a trust fund? Because a trust fund puts all the money together, uh, and so you have more. Uh, it's more easy to coordinate working. Um, for the moment, all this funding that you see are splitted funding. Uh, we when we use these funds. 
we don't, we cannot. It's impossible to use them in a coordinated way. I can just give you an example. Uh, in, a country, in an area which is very important and which uh, Richard know very well, the north of Central Africa and southern of, uh, of Chad, uh, we had a project in north of Central Africa called Ecophone, never mind, and, and we planned to do a, a project in southern Sudan, and we wanted the two projects to work together. Well, because of our procedures, because of the different funding sources and so on, the project in Central Africa is coming at the end, and the other one has almost not started. And, that's, and they were supposed to work together. These are really problems that we are faced daily. And putting all the funds in one, uh, in one pot, in one trust fund, will avoid this. The second advantage is that um, a trust fund has its own procedures. We can create the procedures for the trust fund. So we will not have to follow the normal EU uh, uh, financial procedures. We can create our own procedures, and in that case, we can ease much more. Uh, it can be much more easy the disbursement, and so we can much more, uh, in much more easy coordinate all our intervention. So that's the, the, the main tool. Is this one, and the other advantage, obviously, is that a trust fund. We can put money in it. We could put one billion euro in it, in this trust fund. Other donors can, came, can come, the, the, uh, the EU member state could come, but also it's such a trust fund is open to other donors as well. And, uh, um, and that and that's really would, be, would make, make the difference. Um, it's not a dream. Uh, we are really, uh, we put it in, the, in this uh, document, in this strategy. It's not a dream and just uh, about uh, one week ago, we, re I received a, we received a note from our director general asking for ideas for creating trust fund and where we could do it and so on, and, and we put this one forward. And so it's something which, which is really, uh, uh, they are really thinking at a higher level. So it's really a possibility. And um, I'm not sure, uh, I, I'm going to retire in one year, I'm not sure that I will I will see uh, this realized, but uh, what I'm, working, I so. I'm working for that. I'm sorry, that's a little bit diso uh, disorganized. Um, I'm sorry for my English, but basically this is the, the idea. Um, yes, there is an, just another, another one if I have five minutes. Um, one minute. One, one. Give okay, just one, one thing. Uh, our Director General for Environment, which is of the Department for, for Environment, is actually producing an EU action plan against wildlife trafficking. Um, this is uh, based and, and will be the, the object uh, of uh, an EU communication. Um, this is based on uh, a consultative communication which has been done about uh, one year ago. Uh, and this document is a document which says exactly what, what uh, the member states should do, what it should be do at the uh, legislative uh, level. Uh, it, uh, it is extremely important to coordinate the activity between member states, but uh, it's not new funding. It's, uh, it's just at a more political, uh, um, political level. Obviously, in this communication and this EU action plan, there will be a chapter on uh, interventions uh, outside the EU, and this is our, uh, our document, which is the answer to that. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Enrico, a very uh, insightful presentation. I could only dream to do a presentation like that in Italian or French, so thank you. Um, and thanks to all the panelists for in incredible presentations. I, I want to thank you for the work you're doing, because it's given the scale and scope of the problem, it's comforting to know that there are uh, people with your deep expertise, um, years of experience, um, and, and leadership positions now that are focused on, on all of these <coughs> aspects. I'm going to have to discipline myself. We've got 15 minutes, and I want to open it up mostly for you all. I want to ask one question, though, and maybe it sets the stage for, for you all, um, because it, the, the title of this panel is Room for Growth, right? So a lot of what has been described is incredibly good work, important, and promising. Um, but I want to ask each of you, just for a quick sort of lightning round answer, what is the biggest need that you see 
Yeah, and, and if I can just editorialize for a second, I, I think there are three from my perspective. One is the need to move toward a sort of a network disruption model uh, from an interdiction and enforcement standpoint. And so less episodic uh, arrests and more uh, thinking through how to deal with logistics networks using, using tools unconventional like uh, the tools we used against terrorist financing uh, and illicit economies. So I think that's, that's one challenge. How do we move to that kind of a model? The sustainability questions uh, in terms of economic development and governance on the ground, how does that move forward, especially with the demographic and, and environmental pressures on the ground? And then finally, and importantly, I was gonna ask this from the start, this question of coordination, uh, because there's a lot of incredibly good work and resources being attached to this, but how is this all being coordinated so that we are efficient, we create sustainable programs, and we are as um, dynamic and innovative as possible uh, because there's a lot of good work being done, but how is this being coordinated globally? Uh, and I'm not quite sure I, I see or understand that. So Dan, maybe we start with you, just lightning round. What do you, what do you think uh, is the biggest need or, or area room for growth? I, I think um, I would agree that the biggest area need for growth is coordination. There is, a, there is an immense effort going on, and, and that effort is expanding now daily as we, we actually see exemplary leadership and uh, being uh, provided at all levels, government, non-government. But I think the single greatest area for growth is coordination, that we we need to focus our efforts. Uh, we need to have a, a much more strategic vision for what we're driving to collectively. So that's my. Luis? Well, I would have to agree with you about uh, addressing the criminal networks and having some immediate impact, but at the same time recognize that a lot of the changes that you have to put on the ground will take time, will take many, many decades. You, know, you have to do reforms, but you also have to show quick results. So it's finding that sweet spot that blends the two. I'm going to sound like a broken record here. Um, so I would definitely have to agree that, that I think um, the, the coordination aspects are absolutely key. And in particular, I think what we need to start looking at is um, not only the coordination of a vision, of a strategy, but in particular the coordination of intelligence. Um, this is absolutely key, not only for the boots on the ground approach, but also for breaking up these criminal networks. There's a lot of information out there. Um, it's beginning, it's getting better and better. U.S. government is, is starting to coordinate much better, I think, among the different agencies. But I think there is a lot, there's a lot of need for growth there. And also coordination among, among the donor communities to make sure that we're actually all complementing the work that others are doing. There's, there's lots to get done out there and plenty of work for everyone. Yeah, so you, sorry. Yeah. Again, I'm the last one, so I, <laughs> it's I, a benefit. It's a benefit. It's a, well, I can I can only agree. I, definitely, I think that coordination at all the level and at the operational level, it's absolutely essential. I think it's it's the thing that we have been lacking uh, the most in, in the past years. Good. Let's open it up for questions. I know there are probably uh, many. Let's go with the uh, the lady in the back. Uh, please stand, identify yourself, and ask a question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carrie Lajeunesse. I'm serving as an AAAS Congressional Fellow in the Office of Congressman Jeff Fortenberry. My question is specifically about livestock capacity building, and I think primarily as it relates to bushmeat. We know that our livestock R&D funding internationally and domestically is really, really low. And as we work towards developing countries, the demand for animal source foods is going to go up, and it's very important also for women that are in their childbearing years through those first thousand days of, of pregnancy and uh, two years of the child's life. So how do we look at incorporating our development practices, especially for smallholders, to improve our livestock development that's environmentally conscious and, and allows us to be good stewards of the environment and at the same time address bushmeat, wildlife trafficking, and that sort of thing? Thank you. Kirsten, do you want to take that? Anybody want to take that question? Enrico? Kirsten? So, yeah, so I think you've actually um, um, asked a very, very interesting question there. Um, you know, trying to align um, our development objectives with our conservation objectives and making sure that we are looking at sustainability for the long term. Um, I think in particular when you're talking about, about livestock and you're talking about Africa, um, a lot of this is, is rangeland management, and it's, and it's looking at the um, implementing really, really um, good 
a range management on the ground, range management that is, is conducive to, to also to wildlife habitats. And it's also looking at some of these disease issues. We, off, um, we tend to overlook, I think, a lot of times the, the aspects of the, the, the diseases that can move between populations, between um, wildlife and, and domestic um, species. So I think we need to be kind of looking at all of this in a very kind of holistic perspective. Good morning, Johan Joost, South Africa. Just tongue in cheek, that 700 million euro that is needed is the conservative sales value, final sales value of about 1,100 rhino. So as a value proposition, it's, it's not a bad value proposition. I just think we don't understand the cost of ownership. Everything we heard is so good. It's an A plus, but I think if your Mr. Trump was here, he will ask us what's the outcome, what's the result, and and one already this time of the morning get that feeling we all get at these conferences, we've lost the initiative. My question, and I'm not doom and gloom, believe me, my question to the panel is, are we easy to do business with? You are not always, and we've got to reciprocate that also. We must talk about that today, if possible, uh, formal or informal, because we need to speed this up. If we, honestly, without being dramatic, if we leave today, and, and we're happy with the policy and the PowerPoint, and I, I'm, I'm connected to the Kruger National Park. I have an app. Since I arrived yesterday morning, I, I lost three rhino. I have four helicopters in the air, now. I'm not trying to be dramatic. This is just ticking on and on. So, so my well main question is, are we easy to do business with? I know us Africans, myself, we don't like administration and a lot of paper. And when we want your money, you you, you, you about to write a PhD before you get the money. <laughs> and then you complete that, and then you go to a meeting, and understandably so. Um, how can we be easier to do business with so that we can benefit from, from well-doers and donors and, and other philanthropists? Thank you. Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> Gentle critique. Uh, yeah. Luis, do you want to take this? You, you, you've got lots of funding and, and programs. That you, you, uh, and Enrico, you, you as well. And with this trust fund perhaps emerging, uh, important question. Well, are, are your African partners uh, easy to deal with? Are, what's the challenge in terms of the coordination, whether it's in terms of funding or operationally? Uh, what, what are some of the challenges that you see? I mean, you, you have a whole range of, of different levels of uh, uh, engagement at, in different countries. Some countries are better organized than others. Others are very, very struggling. So we, we try to adjust our programs to, I know we work with South Africa quite closely. In fact, we had some visitors there recently and we donated some vehicles. And the challenge in South Africa is different than the challenge in Mozambique. So. Um, there are no easy answers. I mean, we, we, we try to work with our embassies on the ground. We rely heavily on them to tell us what works, what doesn't work, and we try to deliver it as quickly, uh, deliver it as, quickly as possible. We, of course, are frustrated at uh, the speed with which our resources become available and we can actually bring it on the ground. This is a, more of a systemic issue. But I, the best I can tell you is that we, we try hard. We, we, we try to um, have agile, delivery systems, but uh, the, the, scale, the scope of the problem is huge, so our challenge is to find those areas where we can have the greatest impact and, and go to them as quickly as possible. Yes, um, no, it's, it's a problem. That's what I said. We have money, that's for sure. The problem is disbursement. If I start today uh, identifying a project or an activity that I want to fund, it will take me almost two years before the money go there. And that's, that's a nightmare. And that's why I said our worst enemy are the procedures, not the poachers. Uh, I know that you, you uh, I tried several times to uh, launch the idea to, uh, to create um, emergency funding. It's no, no way. Um, even recently, uh, we uh, agreed to extend the project, uh, you may know, uh, the Mike project. Uh, it was a project of monitoring of illegal killing of elephants. We tried to transform it in, in mics, uh, minimizing illegal killing of endangered species. And I said, I specifically want a, uh, an emergency fund 
uh, to be attached to that program uh, because it's it's absolutely needed. I, I want some if someone needs uh, quick funding, I want that in in two weeks money got there. Okay, uh, we did this two years ago and they still haven't been able to. Uh, because of procedures to establish this, trust, this, uh, this emergency fund. That's the idea of creating a trust fund is just for that. It's really because in that case, we can really uh, find a way of easing the procedures. And I think it's the only way of doing it. If we can have the, the best strategy, the best document, the best ideas of the world, if then we have procedures who uh, uh, do not let us implement it, it's, it's nothing. So we really have to work on, on, on procedures. And the only way today, for me, at, at, at least at our level, is to create a trust fund because it has its own procedures. Other questions? This gentleman in the back. Hi, Richard America, Georgetown University. What is the, your experience with U.S. Uh, multinational corporations? Are they helpful? Are there any best practices in uh, corporate social responsibility and the like in helping solve this problem? Dan? Um, I think there are, there are some uh, great examples, certainly um, uh, Paul Allen and Vulcan, um, uh, transport companies, uh, uh, um, I think um, online trading companies, I think are increasingly important and we've seen you know, positive steps by um, uh, corporations, companies like eBay and others. I, I think, um, again, as this arises as a, as a global concern and cause, I think multinational corporations will respond. I think that notion of social responsibility is really where the public at large um, can play a role. I think we, um, in the last two years, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we've destroyed our entire stockpile of ivory with a very visible crush of six tons of ivory in, in Denver, and several weeks ago, another um, two tons of ivory in uh, Times Square. And, the Times Square event, we got over 2 billion online impressions, uh, 600 plus media stories, about 200, over 200 broadcast stories, over 30 countries worldwide. Um, so as we raise the profile of this issue, and again, I think the public exposure, then the multinational corporations will begin to respond. And so I think that's what we need from the public is is a, is a greater engagement and then a greater com communication to, um, to multilateral corporations so then they'll reflect this in their uh, social responsibility practices. If I can just editorialize again here, moderator's uh, prerogative, I, I think he, this is one of the great opportunities. It, it's, we've talked about network disruption, but it's also network creation and the, the variety of communities of interest that can be brought to bear. New technologies, Kirsten, you mentioned the online challenge and the technology challenge. Just enormous opportunities to bring together law enforcement, national security, uh, environmental and conservancy uh, groups, the private sector, shipping companies, banks, all of which have an interest in ensuring that this problem doesn't get worse and hopefully uh, improves. And so I think there's huge advantage there. Jennifer, with your indulgence, one more question, if that's okay. We, we may go over a couple minutes. Uh, this young lady here. Hi, yes, thank you for the panel. Um, I wanted to ask um, specifically to, to your, Dan your Ash. Name. Identify yourself, please. Oh, Susanna Cunningham from the Enough Project at the Center for American Progress. Um, so I wanted to ask what what projects have you seen that give you the most optimism with combating the financiers or, as you say, the, the profiteers of wildlife poaching? Because you mentioned during your talk that there is an infinite amount of supply for people to replenish poachers as they're captured. So if the issue is instead those who are profiting or financing it, what are the most um, effective programs that you've seen, either public or private, to combat this? Um. I think there's a, there's a lot of um, room for optimism on the public side in demand reduction. I'll go up to I'll, I'll just um, mention 
shark fin. I think you know, we have seen in the last uh, th you know, three to four years just a worldwide kind of turnaround in, um, in demand for and, um, and you know, processing of shark finning. It's, just, it's still a, a, an issue for us to deal with, but I think we've, we've seen, uh, we've, we've reached a tipping point there. And we did that by focusing on enforcement, focusing on you know, bringing it before international organizations like CITES and then dealing with demand reduction in key country like China. So to me, that tells us we can do this. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, in the Fish and Wildlife Service, an operation like Operation Crash with Rhino Horn, where we have, our, we have um, arrested over 30 individuals. We've gotten, with the help of the Justice Department, over 17 convictions. We've confiscated millions of dollars in cash and um, dozens of rhino horns. So that being a, an example of kind of taking it to the people who are making the money, not catching the poacher or the middle or the, the middle people, but going after the people who are making the money um, in, in rhino trafficking. So we can make a difference on law enforcement. Um, and then I guess I would, again, have to come back to what I saw in Gabon, I, I, where you, you have a, a, a national commitment to protected area designation and, and management. Um, so, you know, making a difference by, by designating protected areas and then by managing them effectively. So I, I think those are the three things I would say. If I, again, if I could just weigh in, I wrote a piece in Business Insider a little bit about this, and if I could just point to a couple of things I think would be helpful. I think uh, using some of the executive order authorities that we've used to go after terrorist financiers, proliferation financiers, and others um, to start targeting the networks. Again, this goes to network analysis, intelligence sharing, uh, and understanding that a bit better. Uh, and there's no reason there shouldn't be and there can be a commensurate UN Security Council resolution akin to what you've had in the terrorism context with uh, the 1267 regime and its progeny um, in the wildlife trafficking and financing uh, context. And if you could get China to help support, perhaps even sponsor that, that could be a, an area of greater coordination internationally. So that's, that's an area of potential growth. I think we're gonna have to close it there. I wish we could go longer. Please join me in thanking this wonderful panel.